From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Come on. Let's make it hot. Come on. Let's make it hot. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, who was the big winner for the Knowles out in Mobile during the Senior Bowl? Lawlessness in college football, the NCAA trying to restore order, but apparently nobody wants that either. And Michael Langson talking recruiting. Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway. Physical address, top of the hill. Can't miss it. Build your own burger, everybody. Half pound black Angus burger, usually $12.99 retail. Comes with lettuce, tomato, onion, and pickle. And your choice of a side dish, which could be straight fries, curly fries, onion rings, potato salad, coleslaw, broccoli, side salad, tater tots, or freshly cooked potato chips. But today, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., only $8.99. That burger uh, made to your specifications. Build your own burger. Half pound all black Angus beef. Corner pocket bar and grill. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source. Thumbs up. Five star rating and review. Corey Clark here, everybody. Corey Clark, how are you? I'm great, man. Thank you so much for asking. How are you? I was a very like pensive pause you had there. Very like I was looking up something, but okay. no, I'm great, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking. All right, good. Had this thought randomly uh, hearing people on the podcast talk about this upcoming Super Bowl and stuff, and I think I know the answer. I mean, the answer would be the same. I think the answer you're going to give is the same that I have, despite the fact that we have two different journeys in this life, but. Recent indiscretion notwithstanding, because apparently Pat Mahomes' dad uh, was recently arrested on suspicion of DWI. But, like, would you rather be Patrick Mahomes? Is, like, would you rather have the Mahomes experience of, like, being his dad? Where, like, you had a good little run, you know, like, you, you threw in the majors. And then your son turns out to maybe be the best ever at maybe the most important position in all of sports. Would you rather have that journey? Or would you rather be, like, Michael Jordan and be the guy that was the guy. And then you have some kids who are like good enough to play division one basketball. Hmm. I, 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 I mean, think the Mahomes thing is the best. Now, that'd be great. Like, just give me a little taste of it and then let me vicariously live through my son when I'm old and like breaking down. I think that'd be almost more, uh, you know, pleasurable for me than living it myself, being the guy at the top of my job. Yeah, the way I would see it is like, you know, Michael Jordan had a really fun 15. Well, I mean, it's probably still very fun to be Michael Jordan um, more often than not. But he got he was like in the heart of competition for about what from I mean, if we start at North Carolina to when he retired the second time, probably 17 years total, Um, 15, 15 playing basketball, two playing baseball. And then after that, he's been searching for that, like that next hit, that next dopamine rush that comes with competition. That's why he's such a horrible gambler. He he tried to be a GM. He tried to be an owner. Like he's trying to find this competition that it, he just can't scratch that itch. But when you're when you're a professional athlete like Mahomes' dad was and got to the major leagues as a pitcher, you got to scratch that itch on your own. And then by the time Mahomes was probably like twelve, he's like, man, my kid might be a really good athlete. And so he gets to live with that for the next, what, 30 years? Oh. Like, Mahomes is going to play till he's 40. <laughs> so I, I would think that, yeah, you, you still have your foot in the pool of competition through vicariously through your kid. So, I, yeah, I, I think I would I think I think would say that. Number one, just to sound like a good dad and not selfish. <laughs> okay. right. um, but also I do think it would be incredible to have a son like that. And I and I think that was the most. Uh, did you watch that quarterback documentary? I still have it. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll, I'll. I spent my whole weekend watching Napoleon and the original Wall Street and some other random movies. Probably should have watched something more contemporary like the quarterback, but I'll put it on the list. Or the We Are the World documentary. <laughs> watch that. It's really enlightening. It's fast. It really is fascinating. Okay. That yeah. that We Are the World documentary. It's just about that night. It's just video footage from that night. Um, when they recorded that song. But in that ne- in the Netflix quarterback documentary, at the end of that Super Bowl that Mahomes leads them back to beat the Eagles, the way his dad talks to him, and you know his dad had to be a hard ass. Yeah. I mean, there's just no way he wasn't. Uh, just the way he is, it seems like he was probably a hard ass. But he comes up and is crying and says, man, I've never seen anything like you. And mm. it gives him this long hug. Like, man, I have never seen anything like you. 
Um, and I just – that must be an unbelievable feeling to think – you know, to see your da- your son is maybe the best that's ever done it would be kind of cool. So, yeah, that said, I don't know. It would still be really cool to be Patrick Mahomes <laughs> and not Patrick Mahomes' dad. Yeah, so that's but, the thing, too. It's like everyone's like, yo, you're Pat Mahomes' dad as opposed to you're MJ. MJ probably not the right comparison because, I mean, he might be the best athlete ever. Yes. Uh, but, you know. That's what I was thinking about when I was driving and heard just uh, a couple dudes talking about how cool it must be to be uh, Mahomes' dad. But uh, mm. I digress. Uh, it would be really cool is if Irish show follows my dad. That guy's a grinder. All he does is work, create content yeah. for you folks over on WordChant.com. Hit the thumbs up, give a five-star rating review just because somehow we're tangentially related to Ira and his uh, universe, his orbit of creating content. He was out in Mobile this past weekend, Senior Bowl. I think it's more more apropos to call it Senior Bowl Week than Pro Bowl Week. That should have been the name of the Renegade Express right. mailbag, which I forgot a question in there. We'll get to it here shortly. Looks like Jaheim Bell did well uh, in some of the individual work throughout the week. I, I saw Johnny Wilson being tweeted out. I don't think he played in the actual game. He did not. Uh, but surprise, surprise, Braden Fisk, uh, who seemed to have tried to gut it out and, and play in the bowl game but did not, uh, and then had a huge game in that ACC championship and – you know, we, we really felt good about the way he finished off the season and what he could be. Uh, uses the opportunity out there in Mobile uh, to really catch a lot of eyes. He seemed to be maybe the, the biggest winner in terms of Florida State products that were out in Mobile this weekend. Uh, what did you take away from some of the things that happened in Mobile and what uh, Ira was able to bring back for us? Yeah, by the way, that was crazy. I saw a tweet on Saturday afternoon like uh, from Warchant, the Warchant account, saying, our Irish O'Fells in Mobile for the Senior Bowl. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. He's I don't, Well, maybe I'm wrong. I just don't think he's ever gone out there before. Um, and he's, he went out there for, you know, two guys. Uh, odd, uh, but I love well, it. It's awesome. Wor- it's something to he, do. He's working on a bigger story that's uh, Florida State-centric. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, sure. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, he's it's, not it's working gonna, on a Gator story. It's going to open up some wounds that might be healing already. But whatever, we're gonna we're gonna keep talking about that stuff. But uh, oh, okay. Right. Carry on. Um, Sorry, so yeah, so when I I thought it was really telling. You know, obviously Fisk had a nice game. I I saw like one of the first plays of the game. He has a TFL, just rips through the offensive lineman, tackles the running back, and then I saw another sequence where he got two straight quarterback hurries. Uh, the quarterback just had to throw the ball because Fisk was bearing down on him. The alignment had no chance, like two plays in a row. And they started double-teaming him a lot. Hmm. I saw at least four plays where he was getting the center and the guard on him every play, like back-to-back-to-back, to back to back, um, which is a pretty good sign of respect. That in an all-star game, they're, they're the guy, you're the guy they continually double-team out of the four guys that are down. But um, – they talked to Jim Nagy, who is the – I guess he's like the president of the Senior Bowl. I'm not quite sure what his title is, but he's the guy that kind of runs it, oversees it, uh, always announces the inv- in- invitees. Um, Executive director, his title. There you go. I, I felt like I was – I nailed that kind of in the description. Uh, but, yeah, I didn't know the exact title. So um, they're talking to him and during the second quarter of the game, and uh, I don't know who's doing the interview. I think it's Tom Pelissero. Is that a name? Yeah, look that- at you, Corey. Yeah, NFL okay. Network, yeah. So he's interviewing him, and he goes, you know, he, he talks about the game and all the money they raise and everything. They go, who are a couple of guys that have really stood out? And he goes, well, on the defensive line, it's it's Braden Fisk, without a doubt. Um, and then they, and then Tom Pelissero interrupts him and goes, yeah, because he, he traded Fisk to the other team the morning of the game. Like, he practiced all week with, like, the American side, right. and they switched him to the national side because of injuries. And uh, – and Tom Pelissero interrupts him and goes, "Yeah, I know the coaches weren't really happy on Saturday when they were told they lost their co- they lost their best player, <laughs> like not their best defensive player, their best player on the entire team, oh. is what some of the coaches told Tom Pelissero they lost in Braden Fisk, like not the best defensive player, not the best lineman, not the best interior guy, the single best player on the entire team, they thought might be Braden Fisk." And then Nagy responded with a laugh and goes, yeah, and I've got the text messages to prove it, how unhappy they were with me. <laughs> so I think that more more than what even they said about him during the week, though that 20-second little snippet told me everything about what they think of Braden Fisk, right? Like yeah. the, the way they talked about him so just kind of casually as being the best player on the team and how mad, genuinely mad, I mean probably not genuine, genuine, but uh, pretty upset the coaching staff was that they lost him the day of the game because they wanted to coach him because he's a really fun player to coach. So I, I'm really interested in him, man. Like I, he'll probably be, do you think he'll be the third guy taken 
Out of this, off this team? What do we think? Keon, Johnny, then Braden? Well, Jared. Jared, I am. Uh, Get your mind about, right, sorry, Aslan. Jared. You yeah, cover the Florida State Seminoles. Yeah, so, Jared and Keon. I think Jared's an automatic first rounder. Keon, we'll see what he's first or second. I think Braden Fisk is at least a second day pick. I hope Doesn't so. Doesn't mean he's man. the second round, but he's. Man, I would love the Falcons to draft that dude. He is just a guy that is going to wreak havoc and I think is going to play in the league for a long time and make plays. I, I don't know why he wouldn't be a guy that a team would take with their second or third pick. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, Justin Smith, who played at Missouri and was on the Niners for a long time. And had a is Justin good... Smith a white guy or a black guy? Uh, it's not important, man. We're colorblind show here. That's uh, true. That's true. Colorblind, but uh, yeah, sorry, Jared, forgot about that. Yeah, that sounds probably about right. I mean, you know, Johnny, I, I think, you know, probably wouldn't have heard if he would have maybe played in the game, but, you know, yep, he decided maybe. to sit it out, which, whatever. I mean, he. Well, I don't know. He might. There, there's. There, I don't know if he tweaked something. Um, that mm-hmm. would be my thought. That would be my initial thought is that he wasn't 100% healthy because why go up there during the week and then not play in the game? Although, you never know what these people are being told. I was thinking well, about Penix, this too. I think Penix ended up not playing at the last minute. You know, he was a guy that. You know, was out there all week too. So I mean, I guess if you well, go there, go through the go through all the practices because all the yeah. scouts are there in the entire week watching you work. That's pretty important too, as opposed to the actual game, which is exhibition. And then Jaheim played uh, the first half, and then I don't believe played the second half. Mm. Uh, had a nice play on a, a they. And again, when you you get to see what these NFL coaches think of these players by the what they do, like double teaming Fisk, that that tells you what that side thought of Braden Fisk. And then Jaheim Bell, they had like a. A second and 20, a second and 15, and they just threw a screen pass to him, to a tight end. And he ends up weaving and bouncing off guys for 16 yards. Now, it was called back because of a hold. But doesn't that tell you, too, like, we're going to run a screen pass to our tight end? Mm. Like, that's how impressive he is athletically. Um, again, I think he's a guy that he, he – I think he certainly helped himself uh, during the week, had a nice catch on a on – a, second and 20 throw for a first down but then he didn't play I don't think he played in the second half don't know if it was an injury concern or just like hey I've given you a half same thing with Johnny like hey you got to see me for three days now I'm not playing and then I started thinking like where where does this I started extrapolating like where does this end like we get and I 100% understand why Jared Verse and Keon Coleman don't play in a meaningless bowl game but then what if you're what if you're in your third year of the NFL and you're you're about done with that rookie contract. You've got one or two games left. You're healthy. Your team is seven and eight. Do you just sit out those two games because you don't want to get hurt and risk your next big contract? Right. Like no. if people are going to start sitting out the senior bowl when they practice all week, when do, when does it end? Like you, start, I, I just don't know the the load management and the risk, the injury risk. It's just uh, I get it. It's a really hard sport, and it's a uh, it's a very risky sport, but I just wonder where it ends, where or where 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 does it end? Where like, well, it's, it ends in the NFL, right? Because it's supply and demand. That's what and I'm saying. But even yeah. in the NFL, if you've got, if you're a rookie, uh, if you're Jalen Hurts and you're on your last year of your contract, you're going to sign for 250 or 300 million dollars in in as soon as the season is over, in the off season, and your team is seven and nine. Do you play that last game? I mean, if they have faith in you, probably not. No, they probably sit you out because they don't want you to get hurt. Uh, but yeah, if you're one of these guys that's not necessarily fighting for a roster spot, but yeah, if you're if you're player three through fifty three, man, you're you're probably out there having to probably, play. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just, yeah. Quarterback's kind of a different position, different animal. But um, yeah, no, um, I, I think it. I don't think it's going to get to that level in the NFL. But it's it's a uh, it's a thought that has to enter our minds because of the way uh, the world is right now. But yeah, Fisk was actually the first player in the 75-year history uh, to switch teams on game day. Uh, he was also named top defensive lineman of the American team in a vote from his offensive yeah. lineman teammates uh, during an awards ceremony. So that just shows you uh, how talented like, he is. Doesn't that tell you what, yeah. what uh, the, te- the team, not the The offensive coaches, lineman. The offensive the, lineman. The, guys the offensive getting... lineman voted on that, and they awarded that to Braden Fisk. And these are guys that are going to be drafted. He's not playing against Southern Miss offensive lineman. Um, and – that, yeah, they, that's what they think of him. Like, I, you know, look, there's a chance that when it's all said and done, you know, when you think about Patrick Payton a year from now, that whole defensive line, like six of them, Josh Farmer, six of the guys on that defensive line from the 2023 team will end up being NFL draft picks. Hmm. So if we but think. What are you going to do? I'm sure Alabama <laughs> had 20 guys. Uh, so let's say Fisk is the third guy taken. 
Um, do you think, I mean, it's such a physical position, but Jared's in the trenches too. Uh, Keon, probably the most well positioned to be in the league five years from now. I might actually put like Fisk just behind him because I feel like you can probably get by, you know, being a third round pick kind of a guy having solid production and then you'll get your second contract. Not that you wouldn't if you're, you know, Jared as a, but as a defensive end, like there's going to be so much pressure on Jared to produce and be like this, you know, but at worst you end up being like a chase young guy, right? Like the, the, the commanders. Well, give up no, on that's you. pretty good. Uh, chase Young's a pretty good player. I think at worst, like look at Mario Edwards, man. Like he's, I think he played in the league yeah, this year. Yeah. No. I think Jared verse can be, I know there's different body types and Mario Edwards isn't a guy they're expecting a ton of, sacks from but I, I think I think Jared Verse is built because of that body not just the the burst and everything that pure power and strength and frame yeah I mean I, I would expect him Keon and Braden Fist to be in the league for a good long while you wonder about guys like Fabian um, J or Johnny even to a little lesser extent because of injury concerns and just how long the body holds up but those three guys uh, Jaheim too maybe I don't know but certainly those first three I think can all be in the league you know, have a chance to be in the league for a decade. Mm. All right. Before we uh, talk about our great friends over at Vime Energy, uh, questions stuck in the bottom of the mailbag. Forgot to get to it. Our guy, Old Dads and Old, was saying uh, just to play devil's advocate on the Clemson stuff, Clemson being quiet, maybe they're okay with hanging around here as long as this thing is afloat because of the guaranteed spot in the playoff being the ACC champ every year as long as this conference exists. Are they playing 3D chess over in Clemson? Yeah, I mean, maybe they're thinking, okay, if you get Florida State out of here, it makes it that much easier to win the conference every year, and that gives us a shot in the playoff. Maybe, um, but, you know, they got Dabo now, but good luck. And it's not what I think people will come to realize very quickly, and I'm not saying old dad's an old doesn't. It's not just football either where this TV – in fact, Florida State's always going to be competitive in football. You know, they're, they, they look where they're paying their head coach now. Look what they're paying their defensive coordinator. Look at all the position. They know how – they're all in on football. What 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 really is going to hurt is, you know, Clemson – that fan base does care about other sports, not to the extent of football, but it will get lapped in baseball. It will get lapped in softball, which they just started that program like four years ago, and it's already one of the best in the country. Everything, track, basketball, it's it's – when you're giving South Carolina 35 to $40 million more per year, their athletic department is making that more than your athletic department. You know, you just can't – you can't compete um, over the long haul for national championships. Yeah, you can get to the playoff. I guess that's something. Maybe you get lucky. But I just – you know, and also, where's NIL going? Hmm. You know where where is where is this going to end up? Where team where, is there going to be a salary cap? Are they going to become employees where they have real contracts? Uh, because right now, as we saw with the Tennessee stuff, um, you know the, the the NCAA is still trying to punish for NIL, and uh, it's weird by the way that the blowback from the Tennessee people with the NIL with the NIL punishment and ruling, and how it differed from Florida State. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but that was a completely 180 from how Florida State handled it. You know, their their president wrote about how unfair it was. Uh, they threatened to sue the – I think they did sue the NCAA. Yes, they did. Yeah, so Florida State handled it a little differently than that. But Florida State can only have so many lawsuits going on at a time, folks. <laughs> they're, they're trying to break down walls in other spots. But it's a fair point, but it's like that's – I think that's so short-sighted. Uh, number one – you're, you're not going to be able to recruit, I don't think, like you have at Clemson once we start seeing the fruits of these contracts. Once teams are really incorporating those extra $40 million into their overall athletic department, into their overall football department, uh, football program, Clemson's going to have a tough time keeping up. Maybe Dabo stays, but you're not going to be able to get the best coordinators. You're not going to be able to get the best players because these other teams will just be able to outbid you. Right now... And again, I know I've said this before. This this sport is so stupid that the people listening to this show, some of them anyway, they feel like it's on them to pay for the football team, to literally give money so the football team can be competitive. What a crazy world we live in where you're now asking 
the fans to pay for your players. So that 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 just is a and the point being, these other SEC and Big Ten schools, they won't have to ask for as much from their fans because they'll funnel the money one way or the other. We'll know we'll don't know how the checks are gonna clear, where it's gonna be laundered, but that money coming from the T V networks will end up in the pockets of five star football players and five star transfers. It just will. And they're gonna have more money to spend on really good players and really good coaches. As opposed to and also on incredible palaces for all their sports. And that's why you see the basketball. SEC basketball has overtaken ACC basketball. SEC baseball is way ahead of ACC baseball. It's, it, it, the SEC women's basketball is way ahead of the ACC women's. Like it's The only thing the ACC is good at, like the best in the country right now, is women's soccer and like lacrosse. That's it. So that's what that's what you're dealing with with the uh, with all the extra money. But yeah, Clemson might be playing that game. I, I guess I think it would be really dumb and it's really short sighted and they'll regret it in 2030. But good luck, hang in this conference as long as you can. Could this be like a weird low key pivot point, tipping point? I don't know this this whole lawsuit here because you know as you said, like Florida State kind of took their medicine on this one. You know they you know I think they agreed to not appeal because they probably worked with the NCAA to agree upon the punishment for the whole, um, you know, infraction that was committed. Meanwhile, like Tennessee, and I don't even know how really Virginia, I, I haven't really, I probably should not admit this out loud, but I haven't really looked too deep into all this sort of stuff. But apparently here, this, this all hinges from, you know, both of these institutions, both these states saying that the NCAA shouldn't have the right to put restrictions on compensating athletes. But then all the coaches are saying that there needs to be guardrails and things are crazy. And then there's other parts of this sort of environment that want the federal government to create legislation because that's the only way. So the NCAA tries to do something here uh, and, and they're being shot down saying they really don't have jurisdiction on it. So right. I guess maybe at some point, maybe this is the case that kind of maybe wasn't initially thought about being the, the case that's going to create some kind of jurisdiction or real you know, r rules regarding what can and can't be done, or at least they'll start following something because SEC and the Big Ten also are going to create some sort of what advisory board they, they uh, announced yeah. over the yeah. weekend, which is also not a great thing if you're a team that's in the ACC that they're not inviting you to create the rules for what's going to be the next uh, chapter of the sport. Yeah, just bizarre stuff all the way around. It's uh, that, that SEC Big Ten. Can you read like the – it's like a one-sentence – a descriptor of what they're trying to do. If the people that don't know, on Friday, the SEC and Big Ten announced that the presidents and ADs, maybe coaches, but presidents and ADs were going to form a committee to talk about the future of NCAA athletics and to like better be prepared for the future, something like that. I can't remember exactly how it was worded. Can you I'm, can you find that, Aslan? I'm trying to locate here on my uh, computer here. But, yeah, so the uh, SEC and Big Ten form an advisory group to address significant challenges – uh, the, the quote that Corey's trying to get to address the significant challenges facing college athletics and the opportunities for betterment of the student athlete experience. So what, what, what is so amusing about this is those are literally the two conferences that ruined college athletics. They are the reason we are in where we are in what we are in right now. And I shouldn't say ruined it because I still love college athletics. I still love college football. I sometimes like college basketball, depending on how Florida State looks, and it was god awful on Saturday night. Um, but uh, you know, I, I do like college athletics. But it's like, look, man, why? Why do you two? You you have never once in the in the last twenty years, last five years specifically, cared once about the betterment of college athletics. Because if you did, Oregon State would have a conference to play in, and the Florida State wouldn't be suing to get out of its own, and you wouldn't have just pillared the Big 12 for its two best pro like you would have allowed that all in the Big 10 you maybe you don't pillar Los Angeles for their two marquee programs maybe you maybe you do care about the sport the actual sport the betterment of college athletics and you let everybody eat but no you guys wanted to be greedy and only let yourselves eat and ruin everything else literally try to implode the rest of the sport the rest of those conferences to now a women's volleyball player at UCLA has to go play at Rutgers that's for the betterment of college athletics. You know, SMU and Cal and Stanford now have to go to the East Coast to play games. 
It's preposterous. So don't miss me with what you're trying to do. I hope you come up with some sort of game plan for all of us. But no, why would we think the SEC and the Big Ten would do anything but care about the SEC and the Big Ten? And the rest of y'all can go crumble into the ocean. They're the only conferences that matter, and it's just very, very rich um, and hypocritical for them to say anything about trying to improve the betterment of college athletics when they have been the biggest reasons college athletics is where it is now. Mm. Well said, Corey. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. But, hey, if we could join one of those conferences, <laughs> let's get there, gang. I'm not – I'm not. hey, I'll, I'll admit my hypocrisy. You got to beat them or, you know, you got to try to beat them. Can't, can't beat them, join them. Oh, man. Um, yeah, vitaminenergy.com. Let's go to those folks. Um, maybe they'll give us the focus to uh, push through these next few weeks, months, years of being in the ACC. Go to vitaminenergy.com, promo code WordChamp, BOGO. Buy one item, get one item of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. Uh, maybe you don't want to carry around this delicious, uh, convenient shot that's not even two ounces in a very small, convenient bottle. Maybe you just want to take a capsule. You know, just rather take a capsule of it than have to take a delicious shot of the Sour Apple Workout Plus. You can do that. Those two are buy one, get one free. VitaminEnergy.com, the world's first and only clinically tested, clinically proven energy shot to reduce brain fog, improve focus, and enhance your mood. All this set up courtesy of our great friends that are Florida State alums over at VitaminEnergy.com. That promo code again, Corey, is? Warchamp BOGO. Mm, that's right. Shake it and take it. VitaminEnergy.com. We're going to have Michael Langston hop on here in a little bit, talk Cruton. Real big junior day, uh, despite a, a soggy, sunny a Sunday day, rather. Uh, I think number one athlete in the country, number one wide receiver for the 2025 class. Uh, they also added that defensive end, I think Amari Williams, uh, the young man's name, for the 24 class. Yeah, uh, so kind of came out. And I, I guess I just wasn't even clocking that. I didn't know there was anybody left to commit. It don't stop, man. It don't yeah. stop. There's always something, somebody. So Michael will keep us uh, informed abreast of those developments. So stick around for that. Uh, you did mention in passing, Corey, the basketball game against Louisville. I hate to be so reactionary. Uh, because, you know, I'm sitting here yes, or last week and I'm, I'm looking at whatever website I was looking at and said that Florida State had like a really what, like 40% chance or something to yeah. make it into the tournament. Something like that, yeah. Um, I should probably spend the next like three minutes as you talk here trying to find out that website. but I can tell you it's gone way down. <laughs> yeah, right. You don't have to look. It's gone way, way down. How did they lose to Lu – I mean, Louisville is the Awful. embodiment of – I mean, they're even worse than what Florida State was last year, it feels like. You know, it's weird. It's kind of a uh, it's kind of a bad matchup in this sense. Try to stick with me, folks. It's an awful loss. I'm not excusing it. Um, it is such a loss that it it really it shouldn't. You talk about being reactionary. It's such a bad loss. It made me wonder. Okay, will there be a change made at yeah. the end of this year? Yep. That is how bad a loss it is. Because Louisville had given up. It, it, they're awful. They're one and nine on the season. But what did what? And they don't play hard. They don't try. And yet you. You tried less than them. You couldn't guard them. Well, I shouldn't even say you could. So what Florida State does, as we all know, is they bring up they, – they, they want to they wanna guard the point guard 94 feet. The, the, Louisville does have a very quick, good point guard. And if he's playing well, he's, he's a nice player, really nice player. But what Florida State does well defensively is most teams have real sets they like to run. They have shots they like to get. They try to get everybody involved with passing and, and setting screens and coming off screens, and they have all these sets they want to run. Well, you can't do that against Florida State. Their whole goal as a defense at Florida State is to not let you run what you want to run and make guys beat them one-on-one -on -one and just take them out of what they normally do. And it typically has worked for 20 years. It's worked to a pretty – uh, to, to a pretty good degree this year in conference where you're just making Miami. Miami doesn't get to run what they want to run. Their point guard just has to go in the paint and try to make something happen. And it gets tiring and it gets hard and it's not what they're used to doing. Well, Louisville doesn't care about running sets. They are not a self, selfless team. They're guys that just want to get shots up. They just want to go make plays. They don't care about getting teammates involved. And the point being, they're, the ba they're a bad matchup for a team that tries to get you out of what you want to do because Louisville doesn't want to do anything. Hey, man, if you get a shot, just shoot it. If you can go to the basket, just go to the basket. And so what they have is a quick point guard. You're trying to guard him with 6'7", and it is an utter mismatch, and he blows by you every time, 
gets in the paint and either scores or dishes it off to a big man for a dunk or a layup. And it happened the whole night. Giving up 100 points to that team is absurd. And it's not just that they didn't play hard. Because I don't. They, it's, they weren't just sitting there flat-footed. They are horrible matchups. You can't guard jet quick guys with six, seven guys because they go right by them. And then you're at a disadvantage the whole time. And I know Leonard's not going to change the style he plays. He's going to play what he plays because it normally works. And it has worked for, for stretches this year. But against that team, if you're just going to not adjust and play the way you always play, even though the point guard is torching your ass the whole game, he's the first Louisville player ever to have like like 30, whatever he had, 25, 12, and 5. No Louisville player in the history of the program had had a game like that kid had last night. Or, sorry, uh, Saturday night. So, if you're not going to adjust it, your style of play, and you're just going to guard how you guard because that's how you do, that's what you do, then there are going to be games like Saturday night where a team that you shouldn't beat, a team that shouldn't beat you, gets hot, feels good about itself, has a point guard that plays well, and puts up 101 points on you. And you're not going to adjust because you don't. Um, again, I'm not. That sounds like a critique. You know, they do it. You, you're, they do what they do, and they usually do it well. Uh, this past Saturday night was not a time they did it very well, and it was. It's very, very frustrating loss. It ends their. It ends any hope. It ends any hope of them making the NCAA tournament. You can't come back. They already had a home loss to Lipscomb. This is as bad a loss as that one, almost. Um. And so now you have like two or three, you have two like quad four awful losses. Well, you, there's not enough games to make up for those losses. And there's no reason to assume they'd beat the good teams anyway. But, you know, losing that game pretty much ends the season as far as goals you're trying to get to, attain, stay afloat, stay on the bubble, get on the right side of the bubble. They're not going to be there. They That was a horrible, awful, almost season-defining loss. And where do you go from here with still whatever – what do you got, 12 games left, 14 games left, something like that? Tyler Johnson, name of the young man Corey is referencing, guard for the uh, Cardinals there. Uh, first game of the season, Louisville had scored more than 100 points. Yep. Uh, they ranked 216th in the nation, averaging under 73 points per game. Yeah. Uh, they were 6-15 and 15 coming into that matchup, Louisville. 1-9 and nine in the conference. Yeah, so. But TeamRankings.com still has them as a 34% shot of an at-large bid. Well, that teamrankings.com is not getting my uh, <laughs> approval. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not. Or uh, they don't. We don't need to mention them anymore. I mean, that's their. I'm not. I don't think they have a lot of credibility. Uh, if they think Florida State has a 34 percent chance of making the tournament, yeah. uh, they just. I mean, they were they were on the outside looking in anyway. But you can't afford horrible losses. Well, I know like that was a horrible, horrible loss. Well, like at two in the afternoon, watching ESPN, and they're just talking about all the games that are coming up later on Saturday. Obviously, Carolina, Duke, and. You know, they mentioned the ACC is, I mean, they said like with such definitive uh, sort of certainty, they, you know, ACC is a three team league this se- this season. Three, yeah, three bid leagues. Three bid leagues. Sorry, yeah, yeah, three bid leagues. Sorry. Um, and I'm like, well, dang. I'm like, what about teamrankings.com of Florida State? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, but um, man, just, yeah, that's a, that was a brutal loss uh, that you figured that was out of the system. Again, I don't know if they were going to make the tournament or not, but you felt good about the way that they'd been playing and you just figured that they wouldn't take such a huge stride back. Well, look, it's either – it's two things, right? It's either they weren't prepared well, they didn't adjust at all, they weren't well coached in that game to give up 101 points I'm talking about. A week um, off it was wasn't... a little bit odd, too. I don't know, maybe that was more the obviously – They had like a whole week off, too. That Oh, well, yeah, yeah, that doesn't help. But it's like – so – and it's not like a team that they just got red hot from three. Like sometimes that'll happen. A team will hit 15 to 21 from three. Or 15 of 30 from three. And, there, you know, even if you're guarding them, sometimes they just make a bunch of threes. It's like, well, what can you do? I think Louisville only hit like three threes. They just killed them by getting in the paint and getting in the, to the rim. So either there's two things. Either Correct. They you, both made you, three threes each team. Right. Uh, you know, of course, Florida State only made three because they can't shoot. But you, you either made – you either – defensively had a horrible game plan, but it's not – you can't even say that. It's just what Florida State does. They, You know what they're going to do. You just know it's like uh, you, base. you know it's playing base. You know Syracuse is going to play a two-three zone when Bayheim was there. You just knew it. Yeah. So you, some of those teams played it much better than others, but you knew what they were going to do. So if you're just going to do what you're going to do defensively, so either you didn't adjust, which is uh, something to criticize, or your team just didn't play hard or smart at all. 
But either one of those isn't a good look for your program. Hmm. Either you can't you can't identify what's hurting you. You gave up 47 points in the first half. Now they get they shot a ton of free throws. Learn to guard without fouling. The, the Louisville shot a ton of free throws. Some of it was late in the game when Florida State was trying to get back into the game. So even if their real score should have been like 91, that's still way too much. That's incredibly bad to play defense. So either the team wasn't into it emotionally, didn't play hard, didn't have a lot of juice after a week off, that's a bad look for your program. Or you didn't adjust to a, a really a horribly coached basketball team and you let them do whatever they wanted to you offensively because you wouldn't adjust. That's a bad look. Either way, it's like the things that I thought about this team two weeks ago, I still think they're better than they were last year, but it's like what's what's not clicking, man? That's an embarrassment. It is a straight-up embarrassment to give up a really 100 points in any college basketball game. How often do we see that? Yeah. Once a couple years? But to give up 101 points to Louisville is absolutely – it's embarrassing. It's just an embarrassing, humiliating effort. On all counts. And that does not mean they can't have some nice moments this year. It does not mean that they can't play harder and better and win some big games down the stretch. They've shown they can. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, yikes. How do you uh, – that's just – they, they, they basically sabotaged their season on Saturday night. After, you know, they had played well. They lost to Carolina, but they played hard and played well. They were in the game with – two minutes to go. With a minute to go, there was a two-point game. And Carolina's one of the best teams in the country, and then you go take a week off and get humiliated by one of the worst teams in the country. So, who knows? Mm. Mm. Well, just try to get hot at the right time in the conference tournament, and who knows what could happen from there. Hopefully you're riding your hot hand, everybody, into Super Bowl weekend. That's right. Chiefs, Niners, Sunday. It's going down. Head to mybookie.ag. Use the promo code WARCHANT for an instant cash deposit bonus. You can bet on the game. You can bet on things outside the game, whether it be the NFL draft, or if you want to put future bets on college football, all that stuff is also available for you. And all the props, you know, uh, how long is the national anthem going to be, all that kind of stuff. Who's going to score first? It's all there. Mybookie.ag. That promo code again, WARCHANT, when you sign for the first time, results in an instant cash deposit bonus. Um, not a lot of great value on the draft side of things. I feel like it's going to be Caleb Williams. He's minus 952. Um, not a lot of great value there. Not a lot of great value. Jared Verse plus 9,500 to be in the first overall pick. Uh, that'd be awesome, but probably uh, not likely. That's why it's plus 9,500. Anyhow, promo requires $50 minimum deposit and a rollover requirement of one timer deposit total, including bonus for withdrawal for full terms and conditions. Visit mybookie.ag slash about dash us. Let's talk crewing, but first. Hey, everybody, what's up? It's Aslan, and it's Michael Langston, special guest appearance here on Wake Up War Chant, as well as a standalone video on YouTube. Michael, kind enough to get in front of the camera. Long weekend for our guy out there, everybody. Show some appreciation by doing what, Michael, can we do to show appreciation? Oh, definitely hit the like button. Um, we want you to visit War Chant all the time, but we also want you to hit the like button, so definitely do that. Yeah. Everything Michael's about to tell us has probably already been over at the PRB, everybody, so... Uh, if you're a, a subscriber and you're like, what's going on here? It's okay. It's okay. Um, and if you're not a subscriber, you could have found out about all of this hours and hours ago. So uh, let's get to it then, Michael. Last junior day of uh, this early part of the year, we're about to embark on what they call a dead period from February 5th to March 3rd. Make some noise, everybody. <laughs> um, I think that's literally they can't do anything. It's a period of time where it is not permissible to make in-person contacts or evaluations on or off the campus yep. or to permit official or unofficial visits by student athletes. So dead means dead, but this weekend wasn't dead in Tallahassee for that last junior mm. day. Uh, Kobe Howard. Let's talk about that guy. Chaminade. They produce some dudes. Is he the next one in line? Yeah, he, he, he's definitely the next in line. He's originally played at uh, Pensacola Catholic then transferred to Western High School out of the Davie, Florida. And then now this year he's going to be at Chaminade, which is makes sense if you're in South Florida. That's the team you want to play for because, uh, you know, Chaminade's the top program around. He's never, I, I think, been around a lot of other talented guys. So I'm curious to see just how much he's going to blow up because of how good he is. He's so elite um, that wherever he goes, he's been, you know, the top guy. And, and certainly they just um, – 
finished off having Jeremiah Smith and uh, Jojo Trader was in that offense. Now they they bring in a guy that's just a, a game breaker in, in Kobe, uh, who who I I love the dev. I think this is I think he's one of the most electrifying uh, you know slot receivers or just receivers in general you know around the country. Big time wheels, great separation on routes. Um, he's a guy that they've coveted at FSU for a very long time. This is a guy that it's probably visited FSU more than any place. And, uh, you know, cool story, the FSU was his first offer. And in addition to that, uh, I think he broke his leg as a sophomore. Uh, and immediately when he did that, and that was when his recruitment was just starting to really take off, FSU was the team, the first team to actually, uh, you know, talk to him, communicate with him, say, no, nah, dude, that don't phase us. We want you. You know, so, you know, no matter, I mean, whether it's been good or bad things that have happened to him, uh, FSU seems to be the mainstay always in there. He loves FSU a lot. Um, there's other schools heavily, certainly involved, but I think FSU has been, you know, kind of the one that's has paced the paced the field, as you would say, um, in this recruitment. And I feel uh, he gave, gave a little bit more of a stronger feel after this visit. Um, you know, came out, you know, sporting FSU hat. Um, says now he's closer to a decision. So I think in his mind, he kind of has an idea who it is, and I think. You know, Based on the intel, I tend to lean towards FSU being that place. Uh, I think he loves the offense. He loves what the production on the field looks like from FSU. That's not a concern. He knows FSU is a national contender. He definitely knows what FSU does with the receivers. He mentioned Keon and, and Johnny Wilson. And I like the kid's mindset of confidence where he's like, um, you know, if I go there, I want to be one of the greatest. You know, he isn't like, hey, I'm, I want to go in there and make an impact. He's like, I want to leave. By the time I leave, that'll be one of the greatest that played there. So I like the swagger. I like the confidence. I like the confidence in that Mike has in him as far as his ability and skill, but also as a person that fits their locker room. So I think there's a lot of uh, boxes checked off, certainly for FSU. And I feel pretty good about, you know, kind of where they sit in, in this recruitment with Kobe Howard. They've got him listed just a shade under six foot. They got him listed at 5'11 and a half, 175. Uh, as Michael said, was playing in Pensacola, now down there in South Florida. Mm-hmm. Michael, I don't know in terms of like a timeline or how many other visits you think he's going to take. Uh, is he a guy that's going to want to take some officials during a season to figure out where he wants to go? Or do you have any feel for that? I think he's going to decide before the officials are there. Now, now, I'm not saying he won't take officials after he commits. Um, I could see that happening, but uh, overall, I think decision-wise, I think he's pretty close that he's going to do it before, you know, his season starts. You know, I think uh, probably sometime in that spring, I would say. So I don't think the officials really matter too much. And he just seemed like a kid that kind of knew what he was going to do. You know, when you got you got kind of the finality of it felt like, yeah, hey, I'm 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 pretty sure on what you know what I'm going to do you know, where I'm going to be. So um, overall, we'll, we'll wait and see what that is. But like I said, the body language, the tea leaves seem to, in the intel, seems to point to FSU, everything I've I've gotten from his recruitment at this point. Well, when you have an offense made for playmakers and you're a national title contender, uh, you host uh, top-end talent. Kobe Howard, one of the, the great ones on campus. But in terms of rankings, uh, hard to top Caleb Cunningham out of Ackerman, yep. Mississippi, Choctaw County. Listed at 6'3", 185, a number 11 overall prospect in the entire nation for this cycle. Uh, as folks see on their screen in the video, talking to you about you on the podcast, folks, uh, the in-state schools as well as Alabama, LSU, listed here on the RPM here. Always mm-hmm. suffer a bullet kid out of uh, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, Michael. Telling you. What sort of uh, <laughs> impact do you think this past weekend junior day had for Mike Norvell and company when it came to Caleb Cunningham? Yeah, he wasn't originally going to visit uh, FSU till March, uh, but he really wanted to see Coach Norvell. He's very high on Coach Norvell. There, there's a, a strong connection. Probably one of the quickest visits you'll you'll ever see a uh, visit on Sunday because really the whole thing was he's going back home. He visited Florida, so Florida is a place he hadn't seen before. FSU he's seen pretty in depth, but he really wanted to be around Coach Norvell. There's a connection there that's just really. 
personal and strong and, um, you know, had a really good meeting with him, talked about the development of FSU has receivers. He's not, I mean, he is not even remotely concerned if FSU will get him uh, to the next level as far as the NFL. So there was a clear connection of, I think, pr- production, but also um, personal relationships. Because I think early on when FSU started recruiting him, he actually named FSU probably, his, I think, his leader uh, early in that recruitment. He kind of backed off that. And then, you know, Mississippi State's also come on strong. So that's another team that's up there. You mentioned a bunch of places that he'll see in the spring. But FSU's always had the personal relationship uh, that's really uh, strong. But I think the product is now – caught up to that uh, you mentioned you know stuff that uh you know keon did johnny wilson's de- done uh, just over their passing game with just what it looks like uh he even said he he put some he put some fight for you fsu he said they should have been in the national championship i think they should have been there yeah i think you know talking about the snub so he's noticing what they're doing he's certainly noticing uh you know what they're what they get when the receivers get there, the type of development that they're getting, uh, you know, that's certainly caught his attention. So I think they're very, I think they're very strongly in the mix. He's actually going to come back. Uh, you can circle this date guys, March 23rd. That's the legacy weekend. That's the legacy weekend visit. I think that's going to be one of their best weekends as far as, uh, hosting your know, top recruits. Uh, if you remember, they had it last year where, uh, that was where they broke, uh, broken the brick for uh you know Jermaine Johnson you know so I think it's uh you know Jameis Winston was there mm-hmm. I think it's a big it's a big event you know that they have some of their top elite prospects uh, for that event he will be there and that will be a multiple day visit so he'll get the full nine yards of you know campus tour being around the team more the players which I think is the next thing that he hasn't really done he's visited he knows these coaches well Great connection with uh, Dugan's. Great connection with a lot of these coaches on the staff. You know, including several several guys that are from the you know the Mississippi area. Uh, you know, like Austin Tucker that's on their support staff. So there's a lot of it, it isn't just Mike Norvell. It's it's a team thing. So he will get more time to spend with those guys. And then I think the most important thing is having him around the players. I mean, because you can talk about it, but the players are going to tell you the truth, the straightforward, everything the good and bad, you know, whatever. And I think him being around the players, I think will, will help FSU make a pretty big shift uh, in, in moving upward uh, in that recruitment. But I still think right now, even right now, I think uh, they're definitely one of the main players mentioned that he was going to, na- he's going to narrow his list down the top six. I do not expect a decision till probably late into the fall. Uh, you, you could tell he, he wants to go through the official visit process. And uh, but he will narrow it to six. I think FSU will will be a part of that six for sure, uh, in my opinion. But uh, I think that March 23rd weekend is the one I got circled that I think is when FSU can really make a strong move for Caleb. Choctaw County Class 4A out in Mississippi. They play seven classifications of football, but uh, they've had some real good runs up there in uh, Ackerman. Uh, Michael, does he live up to the billing for you? I mean, as I pull up some of his film again, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, these guys don't look to be the biggest and the strongest that he's going up against, but he just looks like he yeah. would belong on any football field in any high school in America. Yeah. yeah, he's one of the best receivers in the country. Obviously, for those that track my Friday night rewind, I do every Friday. Um, he is like almost averaging like around eighty a game. Um, I mean, he is. He can play in the slot. You can put him the outside. Um, I think Kobe Howard, who we talked about earlier, is more built for, in my opinion, the, the slot teams to fit him the best. I think this is a kid that you could put inside, outside, and, and man, it's what he does after the catch, Aslan, that really just I love. You know, just there's certain guys that, you know, either they get separation of routes or their hands or their speed. I mean, this guy's got a little combination of, of all those things. And, uh, but man, what excites me is when I watch him after the catch, I mean, he just does some really electric things. Um, there's a lot of great receivers at FSU's recruiting, you know, from Jamie French to Dalen McClutchin out of Texas, who I love, 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 uh, his talent, Kobe Howard. And then, uh, you know, certainly this cat, uh, is just, is incredible. So, uh, He's definitely one of the more coveted, most coveted receivers thereafter, and and it shows uh, the way they've recruited him. 
um, getting him on campus, even as a sophomore freshman, I think it's a big deal to – you're going to get a Mississippi Alabama kid. You got to have you got to have a relationship that goes deep, and I think FSU certainly has that. And then March 23rd, I think is going to be you know D Day as far as FSU making that move, and then uh, then we'll kind of see where the pecking order is from there. Hmm. Well, let's move it closer to the football, then closer to the line of scrimmage, the actual line of scrimmage. Michael, hmm. offensive lineman, always at a premium for Florida State. Uh, guys like Cardi Smith, is that how we pronounce? Uh, is it Cardi Cardé? It's uh, actually Carday Smith. That's Carday. how you pronounce it, Carday. There we go. Um, he was very good uh, yesterday when we entered him for Junior Day. And he, I mean, we've seen this with Alex Atkins when he gets his hooks on him and the relationship. I think, you know, you see a lot of strength. Uh, he actually visited FSU last year for a game. Um, so with his team, so he he's very familiar with FSU. Um, certainly, uh, I asked him directly, just give me one thought about FSU. He's like, I just love FSU a lot. You know, I love them. And so he could not stop beaming and raving about this program. So I think they're a major factor. I think certainly uh, you know, Auburn's in there in the RPM, but I think FSU is starting to surge in this recruitment. Um, this is why this is one of the guys I wanted to highlight because I feel like there was some some positivity about kind of where FSU sits, you know, after the visit of, of just from FSU's perspective of kind of where they sit. And I think they, they like where they stand. Um, and, and it's a guy that they've, uh, you know, spent a lot of time with as far as putting in the time for a relationship. And then also, you know, the fit with uh, their program of how he, he would fit in what they do um, plays with a mean streak on, on pass pro. And then as you saw on the run, uh, certainly uh, can get some pancakes for breakfast. If you want them out there, he'll lay them down. But um, overall, I think he's the guy that, that, that they're pretty high on. I don't think he was originally probably on my top features on the hot board, but he will be on my next one. Um, certainly a guy I feel like, you know, they want and they like, and, and they put and the interest is mutual. So I think, um, certainly FSU is, is pretty high on his list. Not a kid that just elaborates a long time. He's just very direct with his answers. Like he knows what he's wants to say, but I think certainly, uh, FSU is on his mind. That's a school that I would say probably in the top three uh, with him and, uh, you know, just got to keep building off of it. But once again, this kid's another one that, you know, farther down the road as far as a decision. I think it's more about the the official visits in the summer or fall. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where – and he did say he's coming back for in March for to watch a practice. So that's always a positive. So I think – He's a guy they've coveted, and and he's he's reciprocating that 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 feeling about FSU, and you you getting you're getting the good body language that you you're looking for of of interest level of how serious it is, and I think he's pretty serious about FSU. Six six three hundred pounds uh, out of uh, Mobile out there in Alabama, so uh, good pedigree, good stats, good measurables. Uh, before we go, Michael, we got to talk about somebody on defense, and why not linebacker? Because everybody <laughs> yeah. loves linebacker. Uh, Gavin Nix, I think originally from the Orlando area, now down at IMG Academy in Bradenton, six foot even listed at 226. Uh, what kind of backer is he as a, as a four star guy? Uh, is he mm-hmm. someone that the thumper kind of guy or is he one of these new age sideline to sideline guys that uh, are in high demand? I think he's more of a thumper, big, big guy, but also I think he's a guy you can put at all three of those positions at linebacker. He feels comfortable doing it. That's kind of I know what FSU is sold of of. He's a guy that feels comfortable in coverage, but uh, on college, probably more inside than than outside. You know, when you watch him, um, and we had a lot of great interviews on on Saturday, but he was probably one of my favorites because he was so in depth about uh, you know just everything, very detailed about. Um, so one kid I've heard that really talked about the stability at FSU with their coaching staff really uh, seemed to move the needle with him. When you know he talked about Norvell staying at FSU and 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 not going to Alabama, uh, I think the fact that their staff has has been pretty consistent throughout the years, and two, the trajectory of where they're going. I think he talked about that a lot, where he sees that they're a national top team, and and that's really caught his attention. And I think uh, I think they're very high on his list. I, I don't he really give a top group, but. You know, I'd say FSU, Florida are, are both teams that that I heard frequently around his recruitment. Um, Miami is mentioned. There's other schools, but I think this is the first time I've heard in an interview where he really talked about the trajectory of the team, you know, and uh, talk about stability 
within the staff. You know, we know Florida's had some changes over there. Uh, we know Miami has uh, recently gone through some changes as well and, and adding guys. And then other schools have too, but FSU has been the one constant. He wants to major in communications. Certainly FSU has a very good, good, uh, you know, pedigree with that. And so I think a lot of it, you felt like, okay, this sounds like, you know, an FSU type guy. You know, he's looking for everything. Loves Shannon, loves the knowledge that Randy Shannon has with the position. He's noticed a lot of what they've done with Kalen Deloach and Tatum Bethune. And he just likes uh, the freedom that, that, that they give their linebackers uh, to do a lot of different things. And, and he feels, uh, you know, he say felt really comfortable uh, when he was around, uh, when he's around FSU and, um, certainly expect him uh, to take an official visit to FSU. Definitely uh, expect him to, uh, you know, take another visit in the spring. So I think he's, it's a program that's trending up for him. And I think this this visit really seemed to have a strong impression on him, both on the field and off the field, you know, with Gavin. I think it was more just, I think when you go to FSU, there's a lot more non-football stuff than maybe a lot of other schools do. And so, that seemed to resonate a lot with him. Um, so I think certainly uh, they're going to be a school that's going to be a threat in that recruitment. All right. Plenty more over at the PRB. Uh, we'll let you get to vacation, but just one last thing on the <laughs> way out though, Michael, just, you know, they've, they've had elite camps. They've mm-hmm. had junior days. They've had talent on campus here the last two, three years. Any different vibe for you overall feeling? maybe not even so much vibe, but just level of talent overall. Is this a little bit of a different junior day? These, these last three weekends in Tallahassee. I think it's been a little higher uh, in talent, but I think the Caleb Cunningham, like visit to on Sunday kind of spoke a lot about where this F- FSU is at as a program. They just want to visit, even if it's just stopping by. So you see a lot of kids that are just dropping by, that they want to be around, you know, the coach. That's why I say March is really big for FSU because that's spring practice. A lot of this is the most uh, buzz I've gotten from recruits and their families about going to see an FSU practice, um, not game uh, practice, as as Alan Everson likes to say, just wanting to be there, you know, and wanting to see what is this, what is that like? I mean, I'm, you know, there's so much high buzz about you know, what FSU is doing on the field in games. And so these, I think these kids want to be around this stuff. And that's a, definitely a big push up from what they have been, you know, where it was more like, hey, can they do it? You know, can they be, you know, can they get more consistency? It's like now they're there. You know, it's like that's that's the impression I get from recruits. So it's definitely, there's a lot of buzz about them. There's a lot of excitement. And I think uh, the big thing that's really I think taking them to another level is the development of these positions that they play. You know, they see the development. It's different. You could say development. It's another thing when kids can see it with their own eyes of what the player's doing at their certain positions. I think FSU's certainly accomplishing that. And I think now it's just about the consistency of doing it year in, year out, every year. Uh, We've seen it for two years now. can you see it for like six or seven years, you know? And so I think that's kind of what kids are looking for. But overall, I don't think the excitement has been any higher than it, it, than I can remember since maybe the Jimbo Fisher days of where you expect FSU to win 10 or 11 games. I think that's the expectation every year that this team's going to be in the playoff. Hmm. Hey, Michael, put that phone on. Do not disturb and enjoy yourself. man. <laughs> you got it, man. He's Michael Langston giving us the latest. Always check out the PRB. Him and Matt got you guys covered. Thanks again. You got it, bud. Hey, thanks to Michael. That was good. 20 minutes of Cruton talk, everybody. You could get all that over on the PRB. That's the premium recruiting board over at wordchant.com. He and Matt Lassere keeping that thing populated with information and intel around the clock all the time. Go check it out. Subscribe. Again, hit the uh, thumbs up if you could. Five-star rating and review on the way out. Well, maybe we'll read one this week. Uh, we're going to have an interview hopefully this week. Uh, to mix it up in the podcast. So we'll have a, uh, maybe not just a one-on-one with Corey. Maybe I'll hop on there and ask some questions, but we'll have something to, to mix up the monotony of these off season pods. And then we'll do a mailbag taking your questions. That's how we do it. So hang tight, subscribe. That'd be cool. Jeff Cameron show one to three o'clock coming up on war chant TV, as well as 93, three FM radio in Tallahassee for Michael and Corey. I'm Aslan. Thanks for listening to wake up or champ presented by the corner pocket barn grill.